Welcome back to another episode of the GSD Show. I'm your host, Mike Garcia, although today I'm actually a guest on a podcast called Free Sales Strategy Podcast, where the host, Nicholas Flamini, an awesome sales guy, sits down with me and asks me a bunch of questions. We talk sales, marketing, and the future of the fitness industry. Check it out. Welcome back, everyone, to the Free Sales Strategy Podcast. We are removing the paywall to information today. Our special guest is Mike Arce from Loud Rumor. Mike, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as we said before the show started, really excited to chat with you. You're in one of my favorite spaces. Fitness is close to my heart. And you guys are out there killing it. So really looking forward to learning how you've been able to do what you've done and pick your brain a little bit. So I think the big thing is just to, you know, explain a little bit about yourself, let everyone know who you are, your audience knows, but but maybe some people don't that are coming across this. And how did you get into the industry and what led you to, you know, where you're at now? Just give us that bird's eye view. Bird's eye view, I'm in the fitness space. So we work with uh, about 3000 gyms uh, throughout the entire world, gyms and fitness studios. Um, I was in the fitness industry for about a decade prior to that. And uh, then I, f- I felt like the thing I was strongest in was the sales and marketing. So I started a marketing company, went off on my own during the you know worst time of the recession. I, and there, there's reasons behind that. But again, we're seeing bird's eye view. Yeah. And um, the marketing was a the marketing company at the time was a company that worked with anybody, real estate agents, attorneys, dentists. Didn't really matter. We did good for all of them, but we had a hard time growing ourselves and um, had a couple mentors say, you know, really get great. Instead of being a jack of all trades, be a master of one. And so it took us six years to get to 42 clients. Um, that's how long it took. It was a while. And once we decided to pick a niche, we picked fitness, which is my, you know, other passion. I really enjoyed my time in that industry. Uh, we got, uh, what was it? 240 clients inside of the next 18 months. And then from there, we just kind of kept expanding, and um, I'm, I would actually venture to say we've got the number one podcast and the number one conference for the industry right now. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I still monitor the fitness space closely. I think for a long time, you know, major competitors, you have Gym Launch, obviously, and some other guys out there that have been doing it for a long time. But when we look at the market right now, I personally see Loud Rumor all over the place. I have friends that are in your program. I have friends that are now employees at your company, and it's been pretty miraculous to see what's come of that. So I'm curious, you know, if you started generally and you picked fitness, um, was that based off of, um, was there any strategy behind that? Was it it because it's what you loved that you decided to do that? Or did you just acquire enough fitness clients to decide to niche down? Where did you decide to just say, we're going to go all in on fitness? So uh, the strategy changed after a first failed strategy. So the first strategy, remember I told you we had 42 clients. Yeah. yeah. And 11 of those 42 were dentists. And we didn't have two of anything else. So the strategy was we should go after dentists because we've already got 11 of them. So let's niche in the dentistry. And we did. But, um, and for anybody that's listening to the dentist, I'm sorry, but I'm bored by the industry. I was just bored by it. So um, I just didn't find excitement in it. And I went back to being general and the mentor was like, well, why'd you go back? I thought that was the plan. I go, I can't stand it, man. I, I need, I need more variety. He goes, do you need more variety or do you need something to be more excited about? I said, I don't know. He goes, what, what do you care about? Like, what, what do you learn about for fun? What's interesting to you normally? I go, well, I've always loved fitness and I read about fitness and health and wellness and exercise and nutrition all the time. That's something I really love. He said, why don't you just go into that? And I was like, I don't know. I've only got like one gym client. How do you do? I do really well. Okay. We'll just see what happens. So I took a couple free gyms uh, that were friends of mine from when I was in the space. I took a couple free clients just to make sure I wasn't a fluke. And I was just doing really good with one of them. And uh, we took the other two on. So we had three total and um, crushed it. We did better than we did with any other client. So uh, that week we decided to niche fully. That was, uh, the end of 2015, like literally last few weeks of December. And, uh, by January, 2016, we were everything website, everything was for fitness studios and gyms and started a podcast a few months later. And so, uh, flawed strategy, the first way, the first time. And then by the second time, I think we got it right. That's awesome. So I I have a question around that, but I'm going to zoom out for a second for anyone that's not familiar with exactly 
who Loud Rumor is. Just explain to everyone a little bit about what you guys do. Obviously, they know marketing, but there's a little bit more to the culture, to everything that you guys have built. And I think that's important to hit on. Yeah, it's funny that you say too, like when they know, they say they know marketing. Um, a, a lot of people don't uh, necessarily even represent the marketing space the way they should. So you'll have the average gym. They think they're hiring a marketing agency, but they're really hiring somebody to execute on lead generation on social media. That's right. That that's it. But like marketing is such a huge umbrella. And I'm I'm willing to say that Loud Rumor focuses a lot more on marketing than just digital lead gen on Facebook or Instagram. And a lot of people think that marketing is really just about generating leads. And it's not. That's a stepping stone. Marketing right. has one function. That's it. One job. Increase revenue. That's it. That's their function. That's the function of marketing. The function. Everything else around that, whether you think it's, oh, marketing's to help increase brand awareness, right? Why do you want to do that? So that you can get more opportunities, then you can get more sales, and those would lead to an increase in revenue. Oh, it's about get more people in the door. Why, why do you want that? Because that can convert into more prospects that could become members that could increase revenue. No, it's really to increase word of mouth. It's to generate more leads. It's to whatever. Follow the jelly beans back all the way to, to increase revenue. That's why that exists. So when we look at all of that, there's four main categories under marketing. And then under one of them, which is promotion, yeah. there's several things. And then under one of those, which is advertising, there's several things. And then under one of these, which is digital advertising, there's several things. That's right. And then one of those things is social media advertising. And so this one little piece under all these other pieces is what people say they're hiring an agency to do for them. And they say, that's my marketing agency. No, they're not. And that's why a lot of people bounce from agency to agency to agency. It's because you never hired one in the first place. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. So with us, what we do is we do help execute the lead gen portion through social media platforms and search platforms for you. We do that as well. But alongside of that, we have an entire mastermind that dives deep into helping the CEOs and the people running these businesses understand marketing at such a higher level over their competition that it's not even a race anymore. Uh, you're, you're, you're competing against toddlers that are hiring random Joe Schmoes to run their Facebook ads as their whole marketing strategy. It's it's a, it's not even a contest. So that's why our gyms are growing so fast. That's why they're buying multiple, multiple gyms. That's why many of them are, you know, getting into, in their hands in other franchise models within the space. It's just, uh, it's an easier path. Uh, competitive advantage, right? What, what are my competitors not doing? They're not doing marketing. The they think they, they are. Question. But here's a cool thing. Here's why it's so such a great strategy to focus more on it because they think they are. So they don't even know what they don't know. A lot of the gyms think they're doing marketing and they're not, meaning they're not even on your scent. You're just winning in the shadows and that's the way to do it. It's so, it, you're hitting the hard strings for me because this is something that I, I have to preach on a daily basis. You get someone in front of you and like, yeah, we're doing a lot of marketing, like you're saying, not to be redundant. If you're running an ad, that has nothing to do with marketing. It's a, a small component of what a strategy should look like in the respect of how to actually operate your business. And the only thing that matters is like when all these efforts are combined, how much money is it taking you to acquire a customer? That's important. And is it working? Are you driving revenue? And I think that a linear approach that's static, learning how to just repeat a Facebook ad for that acquisition cost is typically costing you thousands of dollars in the long run, from my experience, as in not having a real plan. Do you have a strategy or are you running an ad? And the difference, like it, once you can, you understand that, you can acknowledge it and identify it, the rest is history. Is coming through to fruition that running an ad is not the way that you market. It is a small piece of a marketing strategy. And I don't see a lot of people doing that. So I totally agree. And that, that's well, something that I wanted to hit on in regards to like what we see in the high ticket space is like, why are more people not talking about this? Well, because they don't know. <laughs> that's true. They don't know. So even the agencies that these companies are hiring think they're marketing agencies. Yeah. 
that's like saying I'm a personal trainer and all I help you with is understanding how much water intake you should have. And that's all I do. Yeah. The water specialist. <laughs> that's it. I, yeah. But, but, but I call myself a personal trainer. I'm ignoring your strength training. I'm ignoring your rest time, your recovery, your nutrition, your supplementation, your stretching. I'm ignoring all that because I and the prospect are both unaware that those are even more important components than your hydration. Now, hydration is important, just like lead generation through social media is a great opportunity. But man, to call that marketing, just that one thing, you're leaving it a lot of table. And one of the things that you said too, I think it's important to know, yeah, I, I agree. What is it costing us to acquire a customer? Your, your CAC, your customer acquisition costs. Sure. That is one metric that marketing has to focus on. Yeah. The other metric that marketing has to focus on in order to even make sure this makes sense, because it may make more sense for you to have a $1,000 customer acquisition cost and someone else to have no more than a $500 acquisition cost, right? And that's the other side of that coin, which is lifetime value. Mm -hmm. What is this customer worth? So if I wanted to sell, and for those of you that are listening in, I'm holding up this like a uh, keynote uh, what, what do you call these things? The clicker? So that can yeah. click through a presentation when I'm doing talks on stage. So this here, let's say I, I were to sell this thing for $100. That could be good. That could be bad. What determines if it's good or bad is what I paid for it. If I paid $102 for it, it's not good. If I paid $2 for it, it's fantastic. And so the same thing goes. If I were to pay $500 to a customer, that's going to profit my business maybe $300 in the long run because after I have you know expenses and all that stuff, this is what I take. Well, that's not good. But yeah. if I were to get somebody that we're gonna is going to be worth $5,000 to my business, that's even better. And how do how we determine that is how much they pay us and how long we keep them. That's it. And, and how much they pay us, by the way, marketing plays in there. It's not just in determining what your pricing should be, which most people have the most chaotic way of determining their pricing. It's usually one of three ways. You want to know what those three ways, and they're all wrong. Ready. Yeah. Okay. Number one, they copied wherever they came from. So wherever they were from, they just have something similar to that. Maybe okay. make some general detail change they thought should have been done in the first place. But for the most yeah. part, it's that. Two, whatever their competitors are doing, and, and use that as a judgment, whether I should do a little bit more or around the same or a little less or whatever, or the worst one of all, their best guess as to what they think is going to get people to buy. And when they do this one, the worst part about it is the most common person makes all three attractive. They want all three to be good. So when I sit down with someone and I go, hey, looking at these three options here, which ones do you want me to buy? And we hear people say, well, what do you mean? Well, all three look pretty good. They all look attractive. Which one do you want me to buy? Well, yeah, we want people to want anyone. So whichever one is best for that person. Well, the problem with that is you're not using psychology. Now you're begging for business. Yeah. The way it should work when you're doing psychology right is there's one option you really want people to buy. And the other options are just playing as an assist man to make that actual option the no-brainer. They don't exist for the purchase of being bought. In fact, if they were to be bought, the sales rep should be able to say easily, really? You know, for just this much more, you can get this, this, this. It should be that easy. They're, oh, yeah, sure. That's fine. But they want to make all three yeah. options valid. Here's the problem with that. What, what do you think is one of the most annoying objections we get? Not money, not spouse. What's yeah, I have to think about it. I have to think about it, right? Yeah. And we think that smoke screen. Sometimes it might be, but here's the problem. If you gave them three really good options and they struggle to decide which one is best for them based on their schedule, how much they may actually work out, whatever, technically you're giving them something to think about. But if you make it a no brainer, there's nothing to think about because you need no brain. Meaning what are we thinking? So, so the idea is um, there's price psychology that has to come into play. Then when do we raise pricing? How do we value stack? And that's just one of the components. And then retention. How do we keep people for longer? How do we get them to bring more people with them? How do we get them to buy more things outside of the main thing along the way? Everyone knows more money in margin is made in the ancillary sales than anything else, whether it's 
the iPad pencil, whether it's the stamps and ice at the grocery store, whether it's the shakes and the fries at McDonald's, whether it's the Wi-Fi on an airplane, airplane, or whether it's the uh, food at the arena. The margins live in the ancillary sales. The average gym should be generating at least 10, ideally 15% of the revenue from there. Yeah. And the average is 2%. Yeah, it's wild. You hit on so many things there that that we see all the time. And and for those that are listening that may not know, you know, I'm I'm with the SMB team. We're doing very similar things, different but similar for attorneys. And our average ticket is 80k for the year, no less than an annual agreement. We have no fancy offers, we have no guarantees, and we close at a really high rate. And one of the the issues that we see to to your point, Mike, which is it's profound for a lot of people when you have that congruency between marketing and sales, they get on a sales call and you're looking to differentiate, you can create objections by overwhelming people with options. Are you fact finding? Is your discovery meticulous to even if they feel like they came here for something else, are you not skipping steps? Are you going through your discovery deep enough to dig into not just what they came there for, but to the pain and asking if you can make recommendations based on the actual scenario holistically rather than what they came to the call for. And as soon as you can build value around all the things that they weren't able to see, it becomes an eye-opening call. And once they're able to see the things that they were blinded from, all of a sudden, the things that you provide become higher higher in value and more relevant for them to ask, what does something like this cost? And I think that having that one option on the table, it eliminates distraction, the noise, right? It eliminates creating the objection, like you're saying, but it also holds down the fort as being the expert in the space, being the authority of, of why you didn't just drop things down and say, hey, if you're not interested in this, you could do this. <laughs> now what you're doing is transactional. As an expert, if you're, if you're proficient in sales, your ability should be to, to be able to conduct enough fact finding to make a strong recommendation. And the way that you do that is by taking your time through that discovery process having one option, and then from there, in the absolute worst case scenarios, overcome the objections and find the next solution that fills that one void that they committed to. And then you use that as a, as a back pocket way of getting someone through the door, right? And so we see the same thing. And I, I've worked with gyms globally as well. It's, it is the absolute biggest mistake is laying a bunch of options on the table. Well, one of the things too, that's really, uh, I've seen at the agency side quite a bit and we've made changes now in order to, you know, educate our clients better. So they know <coughs> how not to make, I'm sorry to say this, but dumb requests, there are dumb requests, but, but they're more ignorant, right? Cause you don't know yeah, what you don't know. Exactly. And so it's easy for me to ask a dumb question if I'm ignorant to how something works, right? That's just normal. And once I understand it, I can't unsee it anymore. Then I don't ask this question anymore. And one of the things that we used to get quite a bit, and I bet you a lot of agencies hear this, is how do we get the cost per lead down? Cost per lead's too high. Where do we get the cost per lead down? Well, remember, there's two numbers we cared about. There's your lifetime value and there's your customer acquisition costs. So let's focus here. Customer acquisition cost. That's the total cost that it takes for you to acquire a customer, which factors mm -hmm. in the agency fee, the ad spend, the sales commissions, if you give away a free t-shirt, like whatever, right? Like a creative yeah. right, a video editor, do stuff, whatever. So here's the total cost. So let's say we spent $3,000 of marketing and we got 30 clients. We had a hundred dollar customer acquisition cost. Now, believe it or not, I've seen people that have a $60 cost per lead that have a 10x better return on marketing investment over people that have a $10 cost per lead. Let me, no, let me do that again, right? So somebody's got $50 a lead, somebody's got $10 a lead. This person should be pissed according to what most people get pissed about. The other person should be happy. This guy gets a 10 times better customer acquisition cost than the guy that's paying only $10. How is that so? Because there's a lot more variables to that that make up a customer acquisition acquisition cost over just cost per lead. And the cost per leads, the one variable you have the least control over if you delegated that part away. Mm. Yeah. So what's the offer? That's one. 
And then when we get a lead, what's the speed to actually call the lead? What's the follow-up cadence? What's the, uh, what's the uh, contact rate? What's the book rate? What's the show rate? What's the close rate? What's the dollar per sale? How many referrals are we getting at the point of sale? How many ancillary sales are we getting at the point of sale? All of these things here can make your ROI better on marketing. And all of those you have control over with the exception of one, which is a, you have a little, but not as much, your cost per lead. This one, if you've delegated that away, that's why they go to the agency. We got to get this lead down. So you're telling me if we just did our job better, then the whole world would see how great of a business owner you really are. But until we do this good, unfortunately, it's hidden. Nobody really knows how successful you could and should be. If I, if I just did my job, the point is, is one thing, you delegate the execution of some of the marketing strategy or tactics away to an agency, but you don't delegate the strategy and you don't delegate all of marketing. You just can't. You yeah. got to own it. <clears throat> You're right. What do you see happen more? Because you hit on something that I think is overlooked often by gym owners. You mentioned follow-up. And so we can calculate the opportunity cost of what you're leaving on the table by not following up with people that need more than two or three phone calls or one text message, right? That's, that's one thing. It's like, what's the opportunity loss? How much money are you leaving on the table from poor follow-up? I see that all the time, but there's some of the other things you mentioned that one for me just really sticks out. And I find to be painful, you know, when I looked at how people are just, they get selfish with the leads. Maybe they're just generating revenue. They are happy with what's being done from, from either their vendor or agency, but they don't even understand how much money is being lost there. So whether it's that or something else, where do you think out of what you just mentioned is the biggest missed opportunity for gym owners? Is it in the opportunity loss in the follow-up? Is it in just being obsessed with the numbers that don't matter? Like, where do you feel like that critical turning point is for someone? Um, what I, what I think I've noticed and, and keep in mind is just because probably because it's in the front of my mind, not necessarily if I took my time and took the whole weekend about that idea, yeah. but what instantly comes to mind is a lot of them are allergic to work outside of things they enjoy doing. Yeah. So they're not allergic to work. These are some of the hardest workers in this industry. They, they'll work 60, 70, 80 hours. They'll be yeah. up there teaching classes. They'll be you know, moving things around, doing what they got to do, talking to people all day long, right? They'll, they'll work. But if it's outside of what they enjoy doing, they're, they're either afraid of it or they find a way to do something other than that. And follow-up's one of those that people don't like doing. The easiest way to know if it's going to be an effective thing to do or not is to just ask if all else was equal and my competitor was doing it a lot better than me, would I feel confident that I'd beat them or would I be worried? And at the end of the day, if I had a gym and there was a competitor, you know, 100 yards away that had a gym as well and all else was equal, everything was equal, what we offered, the price we offered it was the same. The difference is uh, their team made an average of 250 calls per day and my team made about 30 to 50. At the end of a month, uh, who would I be, who would I put money on is probably going to put the other out of business. After a year, what am I betting on? You're talking 30, 40,000 calls versus a couple thousand. I mean, yeah, it's massive difference. And then, and then you have other things alongside of that. Like if I have my competitor that's asking for five referrals at the point of every sale and my team asks for none or one at the end of a month, how many referrals did they get versus me at the end of a year? What does that look like? If their team was to, work on selling ancillary sales to every person that signs up and at least once a month to each member at the end of the month, who do I think would make more ancillary sales? And at the end of the year, who would that, what would that difference be? What would the gap be? The gap would likely be the gap from where you are and where you want to be. Yeah. Well, I, I do see a lot of that the, and you're right in the gym industry, you're going to get people that notoriously work ridiculous hours. I think that's a problem in itself. They're wearing too many hats. They have a problem scaling and delegating, but follow-up's not fun. I used to get a lot of people saying that they feel like they're being pushy in the sales process when they have it. They're not comfortable with helping people. That's what I used to tell them. You know, you're there to help them, but they're not comfortable with that sales process. But follow-up is, is definitely one of the, the big buckets that I would see. 
I worked with a, one of the last facilities that I worked with in the health club space was out West in um, Northern California. They were a large health club and had a massive staff. But in one of their locations, they had um, five people on board. Now, all they did was membership sales. They weren't doing training sales, just strictly membership. And there was no outbound. There was zero outbound. And as soon as they made just a smidge of an effort, they started to see what would happen just from an appointment setting standpoint, let alone their conversions. And it it was just too, it fluctuated too much. It, as much as they know that they needed to do it, they just didn't like it to your point. And so there was just this massive amount of accountability that had to be held to make it consistent. And eventually like most of those people had to get let go. That was one of the moves. And it was like, if we can get really good at doing the things that we don't enjoy for the sake of the mission, which is to help more people, you're going to enjoy the actual parts that you do like even more as a result of being able to have a, a greater impact on your community. So sometimes it's about tying people down to that, to hold them accountable to, if you really love what you do and you really have the mission that you say that you do, you will do the things that you don't love. Well, and a, cu a couple things to that. Most people don't enjoy things that they're not good at. And so the reason they're not good at it is because they're not doing it. And the reason they're likely not doing it is because they're not good at it. So it's a spiral that keeps you in freeze. But once you start doing it, yeah, you, you're right. You may not like it at first. You got to do it anyway. That's the difference between a, a winner and a loser, right? They both may not like some of the work, but one does it in spite of it. And the other one shies away from it and just sticks to what they like doing. That's it. Um, so now you go ahead and you start doing it. You start getting a little better at it because you got the reps in. You start getting better at it. You start seeing successes. You start seeing successes. You start building up confidence and excitement around it. Now you like doing it. And now because you like doing it, you're even better at it, which means you like it even more. And that's how that works. So that's one thing. And the next thing I wanted to address that you kind of brought up was uh, in this industry, people, you know, they don't want to be pushy. Your job I never understood that. You get me to someone to this day, I haven't done a personal training sale in 10 years. I'm not missing a single sale because that person is going to feel the way that I feel for them. It has nothing. I can butcher the framework. They're going to cry. They're going to feel like I just brought them to church. You have to genuinely just mm, get why do you? Why do? Why would you hire a trainer? I would hire a trainer to do what, if I needed to change my life, for any reason, I would hire a trainer to hold me accountable and to, to assure the things that I want done are going to get done. To push you? To push me. So the reason they're hiring you is to push them, but you're yeah. afraid to be pushy in your first interaction. My job is to help you make decisions you wouldn't make as easily on your own. Yeah. If you say you're tired at nine push-ups, my job is to say, no, you got another one. Let's go. Come on. If you're if you're gonna tell me on the sales process, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I need to think about it. Hey, listen, you've been thinking about this. You've been thinking about this for six months. Yeah, my job's not to let you have one more day to think oh. about it. Can it, can you allow me to do my job, or do I have to like quit today? No, I get it. I get it. Well, then if you get it, can I shake your hand and say welcome to Louder Fitness? Yes. All right. They shake my hand. Hey, listen, I know I pushed you a little bit there. You can call it out. I know I pushed you a little bit. But you do understand, Nick, that is my job. Yes. Yeah. And that's I'll so smart. We used to do that. And that's so true. You have to call it out. If you feel like I'm pushing you, it's because I am. And the reason I'm pushing you is because I care. And the reason I care is because is is why I'm here. Yeah. And this this starts right now, whether you make the right decision for yourself or not, that's what you have control over. I'm here to to be your support system. And I started the second that you sat in the seat today. And they're just going to sit there and they're going to feel that it's right. Belfort talks about it. Transference of emotion. Mm -hmm. That, that is so critical, but being able to, to push somebody is not for the sake of the sale or the dollar. You have to realize it is for the sake of their well being. It's for the sake of their mission, their deep and meaningful why. And in my opinion, when I did that, when I started in the fitness industry, I started doing personal training sales. That's how I started. Okay. It was my first job. I had no, no one trained me. I got better and I got coaches later in life and hired people to help me get better. But I was out selling everyone and everyone was asking me like, what was I doing differently? And their sales scripts were way better when I listened to them. 
But if you heard the vocal inflection, if you heard the level of conviction and excitement in my voice, people felt exactly what I was saying was genuine. They were able to understand that the reason that I'm challenging them was in their best interest, and I genuinely wanted to make an impact. And so if you feel like you're pushing someone, you're probably not convicted, and you're just trying to nudge them over because you're hitting a quota. You will crush your quota if you change the way that you think about what the main responsibility is. Like You have a fiduciary responsibility to change the life of every single person that sits in front of you. That's your real job. The next thing becomes simple. To hit your quotas, to hit your goals, to grow the revenue in your gym will become endless. There is a point in which we decided to one month say, no goal, let's see what we do. And I'm, I shit you not, it was the best month that we ever had because we focused on the little increments. That I'm not saying goals don't matter. They absolutely do. It's an experiment. But that's the biggest thing. Don't be in the industry if you don't want to push anyone, right? I love what you said. Hey, why do you hire a coach? You said to push somebody. The God's honest truth. And so if you can't do it, then what are they going to expect when they get in there? Absolutely. Crazy. I have, I want to switch topics here. There's something that I, I prepared before the interview that I just think is a hot topic right now. And I want to center the conversation around AI and, and the advancements that that's made. Chat GPT is obviously a, a massive topic. I think it's great in a lot of ways, still not where it needs to be in others, but how has that impacted what you're doing, not just for your business, but are you using it in gyms? Are, are gym owners utilizing it to any degree? Like, how do you think AIs can have an impact on the industry? Um, I don't know necessarily. I think AI is, I think humans naturally create inventions to simplify our lives and get more things done. And we end up working harder. Yeah. That's how we do. Um, you know, like the agricultural revolution was like the first like real sign of that. We created you know, a way to farm. And that was easy because we now uh, didn't have to go hunt and go look for food all the time. Like we found a way to grow it here. Well, that that began the process of us settling. And if you look at the history of what happened, well, now because we were growing things, people started living longer. Because people started living longer, we had to grow more things. And because we grew more things, we had people living even longer and we had more population. We had to keep going. And next thing you know, farming became like a fucking job. And we worked harder than we ever did after the agricultural revolution. Um, when, you know, back when, I don't know how old you are, Nick, but back when I was a kid in the eighties and the nineties, um, people got maybe two to three letters that were not bills per month. Maybe that was it. And, and the reason is because it took a lot of time and it's like, you had to go forget an envelope. You had to go write the thing out. You had to stamp, you had to go take it to a mailbox. Then they create emails to save you even that time. And now if we don't make at least 80 emails a day, if we don't, if we get 80 emails a day and we don't respond to them, we feel like a slacker by not replying back or taking a couple days to do it. Right. And if you look at how we've done things, I mean, we've created washers and dryers and dishwashers and fridges and all these things to make our lives easier. But now the women, the women at the time who did all that stuff, they are now working. And now both people are working instead of just a man or just a woman. Now, guess why we're working? To afford the dishwasher, the washer, the fridge, the nanny, all the stuff, right? That now. You, And I think with AI, it's going to take so much off of our plate that it's going to create more work than we ever had. And it sounds ironic, but when you think about the way yeah. history has been, we're going to, people are thinking it's taking jobs. It's going, we're going to be busier than we've ever been. Um, and I think what we're going to start delegating away are the things that um, we don't need to do. When the calculator first came out, there were protests. Right? Kids need to know math, but like now we see it as a tool. There was really, just by, so you know, there were stronger protests against calculators in school when that came out than there are today about ChatGPT in schools. Uh, it was There were like literally parents outside with signs banning the calculator. Before. Yeah, I, I have heard that before. And I've never heard anyone... It, it, within my group of friends or family or at, even on a YouTube channel, anything like that. I haven't heard anyone say that yet. And I think it's super interesting because you're right. When things become more convenient, it just makes sense. Yeah. I just never consider that. So you're right. When things, when we have more time, we become, you get itchy, right? To, to figure out how to do things better. And 
how to take advantage of something else or you find new opportunities that didn't exist before. And, and that's what you explained with the, the evolution of like when things became more convenient. And I think there is a big fear around AI, but you raise a, a really valid point. Like if we have some of the tasks delegated, taken off our plate and we have more time, most of us are going to find ways to get busier and take advantage of that time to be more effective in, in a different way. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think, I think stuff we're going to delegate away um, is going to be stuff like ad creative, um, like the actual images and video yeah. editing and math. A lot of, I mean, we use AI for math quite a bit. Um, projections, forecasting. Yeah. Um, I'm able to plug in what I'm, where I'm at, where I want to be, and what that needs to look like on a monthly basis. And it, it's just whipping out information for me. So I think it's to me, it's going to be like having somebody that knows a ton about a lot that's sitting next to you at all times and give you information, Excel spreadsheet formulas, all that's great. What it's not going to be able to delegate away, at least I can't conceive it yet. It doesn't mean it's not possible. What I can't see is is the human stuff. Um, yeah. hum, humans, we like to see ourselves in things. That's, that's the story we are. So the motorcycle's faster than a human, but we still like to watch men run races. Um, can it, can it imitate music? Yeah. It can create great music right now. AI can create incredible sounds and yeah, music, like actual harmonic music, right? It's great, but we want to hear the story when Adele sings, that story is a real story and that makes us <laughs> feel right. and that computer doesn't have that feel. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's in harmony, right? No, it won't, it won't, yeah. nothing we can relate to. We can't, I can't relate to that robot's story as of right now. Right. So I think when it comes to how it's going to affect fitness, I think people still need to feel, um, I mean, we can get in shape at home. We've been, been able to get at shape at home. We all know how to eat better, you know, more fruits, more vegetables, more lean meats, less sugar, less, you know, saturated fats, less fast food, all that stuff, move more, right? That's it. We all know the answers and we have a ton of free stuff on YouTube. But the reason gyms and fitness studios are growing next year's projection to be 12% even bigger than it is now mm -hmm. is because people like to be around people. We need to feel the energy of somebody that was where I want to be or vice versa and be able to grow together. So I think AI is going to take a lot of stuff off our plate that we're not as great at doing or not as great at doing quickly. Um, but we're... I. I'm projecting completely out of, you know, sheer ignorance because it's still early, so early. It's, we're in the infants, infancy of it all. Yeah. I think anything that takes any type of story or connection, that's what humans are built off of. We're, we're built off of stories and being able to connect that mass. I mean, if you, if you take a, a, a hundred thousand of the next most intelligent species, which would be like the bonobos, right? And you put a hundred thousand of them in Dallas Cowboy Stadium, it's going to be sheer chaos but you could have a hundred thousand people in there every week and everyone knows exactly what to do when to do it they high five each other they know where to sit they know when it's time to go they know where to go to the bathroom they like we all cooperate in mass no other species can cooperate in mass like we can so when it comes to cooperation connection emotion um that we're still going to have to get better if not even better at um, because that's going to be our strategic advantage over the, all the other stuff that's now going to be delegated away. Yeah. It's an interesting, I get, I, I don't know how much you've thought about it, but I think it's, it sounds like you've thought about it. If even if that's off the fly or not, but that's pretty, I think about it a lot. I yeah, think about, I no, I mean, that's, yeah. it's just a viewpoint that I haven't, I haven't even considered and you're going to have me thinking about it all day now. And I do think you're right. And I've had guys say, Hey, you know, sales roles are going to go away. I, I absolutely do not believe that. Can't. For that you, sole purpose, right? No one's going to be able to replace what you just mentioned and, and what I mentioned earlier. When people can feel my intention behind my my own narrative and and what I'm what I want to do for them and the reasons why, I, I don't think that's going to be anything that we ever see personally. Well, here, here's here's why a salesperson's job is to get someone interested, intrigued, and the easiest way to be interested to to be interesting is to be interested, right? You learn that from the book uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, it's so right. Funny. Yeah, a computer I know is not interested in me. I know it's pretending. I know it's an algorithm. But when you share your story with me and you tell me that, you know, you've been struggling with bullying as a kid or 
or you know you feel like you want to motivate your kids your kids are getting bullied now and you want them to be more active but you're not even active or whatever it is for me to be able to lean in and say wait so you're doing this for your kids yeah mainly dude that's a it's a pretty powerful reason i've 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 not heard that a lot or enough probably so that's pretty cool so so the idea is yeah you want to be the model for what your kids become and uh, I think that's great. So, dude, honestly, you're making me want to work out more for my kids. That's that's a really good reason. Okay. Well, hey, I'm I'm, I'm inspired by that. Uh, what's the next step? How do we how do we make this a real thing? Right, like that. Yeah, you're never gonna get that from a robot. Forget it. I mean, I don't know. I can't conceive it yet. So I'm not gonna say you can't, but I can't conceive it yet. That's just something that's not replicable. It's like, and I think you're right. Like one of the ways I'm thinking about it now is it's going to, it's going to enhance productivity. It's going to replace productivity tasks. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to replace the function of what it is that you're, you're trying to accomplish overall. There's just, there's no possible way that it's going to be able to replicate an example like that, that you just gave. You go into to Photoshop or, you know, Adobe Premiere Pro and they've got their AI tool. I don't know if you've played with it. It's pretty cool for its first generation. And you see how fast it can do things that may have taken you three hours before. That's a productivity enhancement, not a productivity replacement. So you're just getting things done faster. And you're right. It's it's just like the calculator. Before you had to do long division, now you have a calculator. Before you had to spend three hours on, you know, maybe variations of ad copy, and now you can do it in 30 minutes. So uh, it's a really great point, And you're going to have me thinking about it. That's all I have to say about that. Really interesting. Cool. I, I love that. Where do you think the biggest challenge as an entrepreneur, I don't like, like to lean in, a, in just saying it's marketing because I think what, what you're doing is far greater than being an agency or, or just providing marketing. There is, there's all the business value, the masterminding and, and just the, the overarching business side of things. But what is the biggest struggle like being in the marketing space as an entrepreneur that you've experienced since you've since you've had loud rumors, since you guys started, what's the big thing that you still face that's tough to overcome? Me personally, or do you think that gyms face or businesses? Yeah, just in general, just like just the entrepreneurship in general for for what it is that you do. I think there's just a lot that can be done. And so we get stuck in what's the most important thing to work on. You know, with marketing, like I said, it's it's wide. There's a lot of things that you can do to increase revenue whether it has to do with price manipulation or bundling or whether it has to do with product development, the naming of it, uh, whether it has to do with how you sell it, where you sell it, you know, where you're actually going to put it, um, partnering, like strategic partnerships, different campaigns that you run, seasonal stuff. I think there's so much that there's an opportunity to be taught so many things, to be better at so many things. And entrepreneurs already have shiny object syndrome. So we just jump from one thing to another and we go, okay, well, about TikTok ads? Okay, well, maybe I should, you know, do this type of a sales approach. Oh, what if I bring it down to one product instead of three? Or what if I do weekly billing instead of monthly or whatever? Like there's, there's so many things that you can do um, under the marketing umbrella. And there's so many ideas out there that are coming in regularly I think it's a lack of having a plan that people can stick to and believe in. And instead of bouncing from thing to thing that might work better right off the bat, um, working on optimizing the things that you've already decided are going to be good if executed perfectly. So I think that's the biggest challenge. There's a lot that you can do. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, how do you solve that? And you, you hit on it a little bit, having a plan and sticking to it and not deviating every time something new may come out or seem to be attractive, but that's tough. I mean, I've been there myself. I mean, for eight years, I was consulting on my own. I had a small team. And I will tell you that I suffered from that greatly, trying to keep up with what everyone else was doing, trying to find the new cutting edge thing all the time. And I think you sacrifice. I know, I know that this probably put me out of business, essentially, when I decided to, to, to shut everything down. You lose focus on, on the steps, like the basics right? You, you lose focus on the things that matter the most. And I don't think that there's a, a wrong move to want to improve what you're doing, but how do you balance that? I go, what is the, what is the easiest way to get that done? And I've always struggled with it. And so you hit it on it a little bit, but like, where do you think the easiest way to handle something like that is? 
I, I think what you said is understanding what the basics are and like deciding these are basics and we got to get down or these down to go back to fitness again. And just because parallels are great. And I think everybody can listen to it regardless of who you are. Yeah. Everybody knows that if I wanted to get better fitness results, I eat healthier foods. I know generally what those are. Eat less food. I know generally what that means. Move more. Mm-hmm. Rest better. Drink more water. Stay away from drugs, alcohol. If I do that, I know I'm going to see progress. For like, sure. And then if I were to take any one of those things, just one, and pick one of those things and do it at the highest level, I get even better. If I were to say, okay, what if I really focus in on nutrition? What if I didn't worry about the science? What if I just walked every day for an hour? And what if I just slept my seven hours, whether that's good for me or not? I don't know. I don't have to do, go do old tests. What if I just focus on my nutrition and getting the exact amount of calories I need? Or what if I just focused on constantly getting more calories burned on a daily basis? You left everything else to basic. You would see even more progress. Once we have a rhythm, now I know exactly how much I should move. Great. I got habits here. What's the next one thing I can do? And keep in mind, there's hundreds of things you can do. We could do intermittent fasting. We could do keto diet. We could start plugging stuff in to measure our sleep and make sure we get the exact amount of sleep with with the way like the sun comes up and all that shit. And we can make sure we drink a lot of water and put our you know elements in there where we have our potassium and our sodium. And we could do supplements. We could do TRT and we can do all this other shit too. We could, yeah. But when you start doing so many things, you start doing none of those things well, and so then nothing works. Yeah, and that's what happens to real people. Yeah, I wish I wish that I learned that six years ago when I was just young and thought I had it figured out, which that's still a short time period. You know, that's not a long time, six years ago, but the amount that I've learned from that time and now, when I look back, I'm surprised I didn't go out of business in two years. It took eight. I mean, the, the things that I was trying to do, the triggers I was not willing to pull, trying to do everything myself for the most part. And I was always, I was always doing a thousand things, the next best thing. And it was tough. So I think that's great advice. You have to stick to the basics. You have to focus on what matters and measure that stuff. Realize what happens when you start skipping steps that are required. The, the things well, that we know for sure are critical. And here's the thing too, for everyone listening, is important to know. Six years ago, where I would say I, I wasn't as sharp as I am today either, and I have way more sharpness to go. I'm still young, but I know I'm. if, if I'm not sharper than I was six years ago, there's a problem, right? So that's for sure. Um, Six years ago, I was making a lot of mistakes that I'm not making today. Uh, But here's the advantage that you and I had that not everyone's going to have. The economy was pretty great. And it was pretty hard to fail six years ago. You could make a lot of mistakes six years ago and still not fail. Um, The question is, how do we get smart enough and good enough so that we also don't fail during a recession or when things are tougher? Right. Um, but I mean, six years ago, you're talking 2017, you and I were bowling with the bumpers on. Oh yeah. We, we couldn't hit, we couldn't not hit a pin. That's true. You know? Um, but once the economy goes down, if we don't know how to bowl without the bumpers, um, we're going to find ourselves in the gutter like many do. And so the idea is how do we get so good at bowling while the bumpers are on, not necessarily start being able to use them less and less. And we really understand business. And what we work hard with our gyms is to teach them how to really run a business so that whether the bumpers are on or off, it doesn't matter. When the bumpers come off, you win a lot more games because everyone you were competing against that needed those bumpers, they're in the gutter. They're gone. The, the, everything just opened up for you. And so um, anyway, that's something yeah, that we work hard with. Cool. metaphor we use quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, this, this is exactly what happened to me. I mean, things were, I was already in a decline that I could not see because of the way that I was navigating everything to the example that we're just talking about, looking to do a thousand things. The mission of the business was starting to be diluted. I wasn't able to see that. I thought it was expanding and COVID hit and I'm not an excuse maker. This is the God's honest truth for everyone listening. I was not good enough to survive. Now, here's the thing. We learn from it. We move forward. Obviously, we need to get better. That was so difficult for me. I didn't have the things in place. I wasn't prepared. I seeked help, and there was there was improvement, but I dug myself 
a ditch probably a year and a half before that happened that I, th like there was a blanket over the hole and I walked right on it mm -hmm. as soon as a, a small catastrophe hit. There's a lot of companies out there that were doing what I did that not only survived, but thrived through that period. It was a life lesson, right? That's really all that it was. But it's interesting because you don't ever think anything bad's going to happen. You can't really gauge the economy. No one knows what's going to happen, right? There's You can look at things, but you don't really know for sure. You have to have the contingencies in place. And you're right. You have to be ready to survive when things are not easy. Bowling with the bumpers on. It's true. 100% man love it so I think we're getting to a point here where we can conclude this I have two things <laughs> I just want to hit on really quick because I just had Rick on the episode prior to this obviously I know that you know Rick well you've got some alloy franchises on your own and I just want you to speak a little bit to you know consulting so many gyms you know around the globe doing what you guys have done at such a high level, why have you decided, right, to to go in that direction and say, hey, I, I believe in the Alloy franchise. I'm going to I'm gonna have another revenue stream of growth here to impact more people. What is it about the Alloy franchise? And I love it. This is why I had Rick on. I, I've been following him for a long time too. But what is it that you find to be critical about that franchise that you resonate with? Um, one, I believe in the leader. I like Rick a lot and I think he's a super smart guy and I think he's hungry to, to, you know, build a really great company. So I believe in the leader. Um, two, I believe in the product. Uh, I think the product is perfect for the ideal target demographic, which are people above the age of 45, a lot of people in that 50, 60, even higher age range. I think the way the products deliver to the culture, all of that is fantastic. And I believe in the economics. I think the economics make a lot of sense. I think uh, the way the model's set up, it's a 1,500 to 1,800 square foot space. Overhead's very low. Don't need more than a couple employees. Um, you could pay them really well because of the margins. And um, the way that you can train <laughs> multiple people at once and be able to earn a really good hourly wage overall and the scalability of it's fantastic. So... I believe in the leader, I believe in the the, the company, and I believe in the economics. Um, those three things are, and I believe in myself. I believe that I, I have what it takes yeah. to be able to get the franchises that are the franchise locations that I take ownership of. Uh, I believe that I can build the right people in there to, to take it to the highest level. Yeah, I love that. I do think it's a great model. I think small group is, it's been growing for a long time, but it's still there. Being able to maximize, I always look at revenue per square foot. How can you maximize the revenue per square foot? It's the easiest way to do it. I think one-on-one -on -one training is great. It's a lot harder to scale. It's just the, mm -hmm. the God's honest truth. Yeah. And anyone well, you, can do it you, for a you while. Can. Yeah, scaling one-on-one -on -one training is, is I don't even consider that scalable. I consider that, that's great for the one person that's going to do it. But um, it's hard to build a brand around it. You're building a brand for the trainer. <laughs> yeah. You are. And, it, and it's tough. Some people still get caught in that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's been long enough at this point where if you don't know better by now, listen to this and consider the change to some degree to get mm -hmm. the small group training moving. But there's one distinction that I want to make to end this and then ask you a final question is there's a difference in my opinion. I want your insight on this on franchising and having a me too business. And so w when I look at there's a one of the Harvard review books that I have it sitting back here is it, it, the second chapter. I reread this all the time to make sure that I never lump into this. They talk about operational efficiencies. Okay. And how operational efficiencies alone, while you figure out what worked for someone in the past, adoption is the fastest form of success. Adopting methodologies that are proven is smart. But I see so many gym owners trying to do exactly what the last person did. And so the difference between having a unique model and offering something different versus a franchise, which is a brand, okay, it's a brand that's a product, it's productized, right, in a sense, like, how can you get people to say, I'm going to commit to a franchise so I can use that speed to success, but it's recognition through branding, right? There's advantages there, but stay away from if you decide not to franchise, and staying away from being a me too business, which is just doing what your neighbor is doing. 
following what the last person did. Ident someone saying, oh, this is basically an orange theory. Or, oh, you do what this person does. How do you remove yourself from just adopting, and we see this in the high ticket space, right? Everyone just replicating each other and it's like, oh, it's a me too business. And that's why what you're doing is different and you stand out for a reason. How do you get gym owners to follow the frameworks that are proven and stay away from that me too model of, of, of thinking? And then also, would you ever recommend someone to just say, hey, if you want to adopt those principles in stone, consider a franchise? So the question is, it's how do we help? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the question, just to be clear, is how do we get thousands of gyms to be able to follow a set of principles and a way of doing things, yet somehow get them all to be unique in their own way? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what's your favorite fast food restaurant? Going to have to go with a good old Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Okay, great. I, I want you to... I want you to take that, and I bet you anything, I know how that runs. I've been to Taco Bell in a while. But now I'm going to take the next restaurant. There's another type. Of, that's, that's its own fast food style. Then you got the next style. The next style is a subway style, you know, where you walk up to the counter and then, like, they make shit as they go. Yep. Right? And then you got the third style. And the third style is the sit down. Now, I don't know what your favorite sit down restaurant is, but I'm guessing this is the system. You make a reservation or you walk in hopeful that they have a spot open. When you go in, the hostess is there or the host, and their job is to find out if you have a reservation or how many are in your party. Then from there, uh, they find your table. They strategically put your table in a place where they think you're going to be able to get the fastest service based on a rotation within uh, this the, the waiter that you have. And then from there, somebody's going to come by and take your drink order. And then from there, you're going to be asked how things are going. You're going to be told a special. Would you like to start with an appetizer? You order an appetizer. Once that's done, um, they're going to come by and ask you what you like for your entrees. You order your entrees. From there, you get your appetizer. Once you're done, the entrees follow. Once that's done, they make a joke. It's usually like, hope you save room for dessert. And then after that, they give you a dessert menu. You either order the dessert or you don't. And then they bring you a check in something black, usually like a, a holder bill or they put it on a black tray or something like that. You pay with a credit card, you leave a tip and you leave. Now, I don't know what your favorite restaurant is, but am I pretty close to nailing it? Yeah. <laughs> how do you think I nailed that restaurant without even knowing the brand? How, how did I do it? It's a good question. I'm curious to, to the answer here. Because Nick, the only two things that separate any business like a restaurant is the food and the experience, mm. the atmosphere. The only two things that separate the gym are the workout, the modality, and the experience, right? How they do things. Yeah. What doesn't separate your restaurant, what's not going to make them unique is if they do something different out of that order. In fact, that's what makes your experience better because if they took your dessert order before the appetizer, but that's just the way we do things here. You'd be like, oh, that's, okay, that's weird. If you had to seat yourself, if certain things were out of order, it actually takes away from your experience because you're grading things that you shouldn't have to grade, right? Like I want to have the most fluid thing. That's why the best restaurants in the world that you are like, dude, these guys are so cool. Still follow the process I just gave you. So when you look at that, the fast food restaurant, the Chipotle or Subway style, when you go to Nordstrom's versus Macy's yeah. or whatever, like there's a there's a, a prince, set of principles to follow that's great for success, right? Banking has their own thing. But what's different is not those things. Those should be the same to improve customer experience because I want to know where to go without having to think. There's a reason light switches are where they're always at. Right. Like I, I know where a light switch is intuitively when I walk into a room. I know where the power on button on a remote control is at all times. Yeah. Right. So the point is we don't want to make unique in a thing that helps us flow through better the product and the atmosphere. Right. These are the things that we want to make unique to us, not the stuff that we teach. The stuff that we teach allows you to be able to build a much better, more successful company. That that's one of the better answers that I that I've had on the show. I, I usually ask the operational like efficiency question every time. And I, I just think the reason is that there is a lot of truth in adoption being one of the fastest forms of success. 
you don't want to lean on that because I do think you can lack identity if you do exactly what someone does. But the examples that you just gave shows that you can have the same level of operations. You can function similarly. You can put a, a unique spin on it, but it's about not reinventing the wheel, but taking that wheel that we know is successful and allowing it to stand out and doing so by having an exceptional delivery process and experience. Right. To speak of taking the wheel, how confident are you that you could probably drive one of my cars? Very confident. You don't even know what car it is, no. right? It doesn't matter. No need to. It, <laughs> your experience might be different, Yeah, but you'll be able to get from A to B because you'll know where to put the key. You'll know where to switch into drive. You'll know how to gas, how to brake. You'll know how to turn. Those things are staples. It's a hot topic right now. You know, I, I think it's a hot topic in marketing, so I don't want to shift it because obviously gyms, there's going to be similarities. A lot of companies are the same. Oh, everyone's doing the same. Everyone's doing the same. And there is a degree of truth to that, which is why I do think the efficiencies alone, the steps alone are not going to differentiate you. They're not going to, it's going to get you up to a certain point of success and that's it. And being able to deliver that experience and, and the way that you just explained that, I think is, I wouldn't change that explanation. I think it's a perfect example. It's one of the better answers I've had. And I think it's, it was also well thought out. Um, and so part two to that, because I want to keep this to fitness here is if someone's considering just starting a gym from scratch or wanting to franchise, where there's no wrong answer. Where do you, where do you think someone can choose what's right for them based on their needs? Like, where, where would you recommend one over the other? Is it your only business or is it an additional business? That's a great point. Uh, yeah. So let's let's assume that. I, I think here, if it's your only business, you're going to want to do it from scratch. If it's secondary, well, maybe, franchise. maybe, maybe, maybe. Right. So, so for me, if it's like, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, I love creating, I love storytelling. I love vision. I love all the stuff that comes with what would make an entrepreneur an entrepreneur, but I'm committed to growing the company I've got. Mm -hmm. So all the additional businesses that I've got outside of this company don't need me in, to be a part of it. I chose franchise as opposed to a new start from scratch model because I don't have an ability to clone myself and be a great leader at both places at 100% from the ground up, right? So that's why I'm, I, ha I did it that way. However, let's say it was my only business. Then I have to identify, would I make a better CEO or a COO? If I would make a better COO, an executor, somebody that's going to get the things done, yeah. franchise is great, right? Because the franchisor is, I'm sorry, the franchisee is not going to need to exercise entrepreneurship in many places when he's running a franchise. He's just going to have to execute it when it comes to like creativity around recruiting and, you know, motivating their team. But even a COO can do that if the CEO is right. He's not going to have to create any new ideas or innovate anything. Um, so franchise is great for that type of person. Um, but for a person that gets bored and doesn't want to follow rules, <laughs> wants to be able to change rules on a whim. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, you should, you don't do that with a franchise. Like the goal, when you decide to be a part of a franchise, you may be the business owner, but you are an executor. You are not the entrepreneur. The Rick Mayo is the entrepreneur. Yeah. Me in that business, I'm not the entrepreneur. Me in that business, I'm a franchisee, which means I'm more of an operational person than I am a creative person. My job is to just make his shit real in more places. So I think it just depends who you are and where you're at in your life and what else you've committed to. That's why I just yeah, like, yeah, and I wasn't even directing that question to you. It's just, you know, what, what, like the advice. I mean, but that's why I'm saying that's why I chose it. And that was my good decision point. filter. So anybody, I think could use that same decision filter, right? Like yeah. who are you and what else do you have going on? If you have nothing else going on and you love creative stuff and you don't like following rules, start your own thing. Yeah. I think that's a great way to look at it. I've, uh, I've seen a lot of people go the franchising route and, and they're not successful. And I think that it's not the model, whether it's even some old school models, it's usually their enthusiasm behind feeling like they can't break out of the box. And then I've seen franchising be the perfect solution because they're so green to entrepreneurship. They need that support system and speed to success. And they can be enthusiastic behind it. They wind up loving the brand. And I just think that the passion behind 
what it is that you're doing is the, the critical point. Did you experience alloy? Now you want to be an alloy owner. I've seen that, right? And it's like, just as an example, if you love that brand and you're okay with it, like you said, following the rules, I think it's a great option. And, and if not, you, you want to do your own thing. That's cool too. There's no, there's no yeah, wrong, I, wrong answer. I love, I love food. I'm not going to put up a restaurant because I love food, <laughs> right? So yeah. I can still love food and go eat there every day if I want to. Um, because once I start the restaurant, I may start to resent that dish because of all the things that go into it and have to come away, you know? So you have to know, do I really want to be a business owner? If the answer is yes, then great. Um, but what I will tell you is that the big challenge we've seen as well is the wrong people running a fran uh, the wrong people in a franchise location and the wrong people opening up an independent. Sometimes they need to swap and we have to help people figure out how to navigate through that. And also another problem is we work with 56 franchises. Maybe five are good. Yeah. The other 50 or so, they're not setting up their franchisees for success. Um, they don't have a lot of things built in, and that's fine, but they, they're not partnering with companies like us enough in order to really help their franchisees be successful. Most of the franchisees we work with in whatever franchise, most of them, honestly, almost all of them, are in the top 10 of the franchise that they're in. Yeah. We get them to be most successful. Why? The same thing I told you before. You're competing against toddlers. Right. You're you're someone that's now got a set of tools and you're competing against toddlers that aren't given the right tools. So franchisors love working with us because we help them make more money and we help them with their marketing problem because franchisors always looking to expand and get more franchisees, but not really. What you care about is having more locations out there. What's better to have 10 single location franchisees or to have two multi-unit locations? you know, for franchisees exactly. where they have five locations easier. If, if you have people that know what they're doing, you're going to sell more locations left and right because they want five locations. They want 10 locations. They want 15 locations. And those people are the ones making the most money. So you're selling more locations to people that make more locations profitable. That's the best recipe. So um, that's why we work so much with franchise. They kind of like what we can do for their franchisees. Yeah. And for the independents, I mean, cool thing is we can get you to do whatever we want. There's no rules, no barriers. Yeah, there, that's the advantage there for sure. It, there's a there's a rabbit hole I could go down with the with what you just said around you know having the franchisers that are at the top working with a program like your, yourself. I've experienced that. I worked with hundreds of Anytime Fitnesses at one point, and you could see the discrepancy between people that came in. And it's not the model; it, it's the tools that are being given to the people that need to run that model smoothly. So. I love it. I've got one last thing here because we're getting close on time. Not to rush this because this has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, if you could go back and do it all again, is there anything that you would do differently? I don't ask yeah. what you would do differently. Just yeah, I would do a, thou a million things differently. I know the answer should be, the stoic answer should be no because everything I've done has got me to here today. Well, yeah, but where yeah. could I have been, right? Like, so, exactly. I mean, because if I would have done things differently, I could have been at another place that's better where I would have said I wouldn't have done anything differently because it's where I am today. So we can't assume our life would necessarily be worse. Um, yeah, I would do a lot of things differently. I would have studied leadership a lot sooner. Um, I, I thought I took for granted how good I was at leadership. I lost good people that I didn't have to lose because I failed them, right? I would have done that differently. Um I would have understood marketing at a higher level earlier. I thought marketing was, you know, basic. And I, I and then even when I learned that there was a, a deeper rabbit hole to it, I didn't like take it for granted. I, all right, I took it for granted. I should have studied more about it. Um, I didn't like sit down and, and look at my money the way that I, I do today. I just kind of like figured things will work itself out. I think if I would have done all those things better, I would have not only been a better business owner, I would have had more jobs created faster. I would have been provided a better service to clients faster. I would have been a better father, right? Because if you learn how to be a better leader, leader, you're a leader everywhere you are, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, out of all of them, I would say nobody's a born leader. You know, I heard, I, I think it was John Maxwell, might have been uh, Pat Lincioni or somebody, but somebody said, when someone's born, the doctor says it's a boy or a girl. They never say it's a leader, right? No one's born a leader. You're born naked, wet, and afraid. Right. And, and even if you have some natural ability in you to maybe be a better leader quicker, 
it doesn't mean that the best leader in the world didn't learn some hard lessons along the way as to how to be a better leader. And so I think, uh, I think if you could learn how to be a better leader faster, then all the other things actually come along with it. But if you get better at marketing, but you're still a shitty leader, like it's hard. It is hard. No, I love that. And, and even getting better at leading yourself in a lot of ways, right? The yeah. you're making. So that's a great answer. Very transparent, very genuine. I don't think it's easy for people to, to say that. So again, that's, that's one that I think everyone should really listen to. We make mistakes. There's definitely things that I would go back to and do differently. Um, even when I was doing my own thing, especially, um, I've, ru I ruined relationships over, um, things that I did professionally and personally, and there's just certain things you can't go back on. And so if I had a time machine, I 100% would go back and do things differently, but I'm happy everything worked out for you the way that it has. And it led you here. We appreciate you being on the show. And I think you, ha you have some beautiful things ahead of you. I can't wait to watch what loud river does in the future. I obviously wish you the best of luck with the alloy franchises that you're you're currently deploying and i know that the future is bright for loud rumor and it's uh it's an honor to have you here and is a a, a a a podcast full of wisdom i hope everyone's enjoyed it and thank you for being a guest thanks nick appreciate it absolutely